This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Dune Talk. So on this week, I'm uh, joined as always by Simon. Hello. I'm still trying to grow my Oscar Isaac beard. <laughs> I'm get ready for the movie, counting down the days, the hours. Can't wait to talk about Dune again. It's looking good, Simon. And Garen is back again. Hi, Garen with DuneCompanion.com. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Kara Kennedy from Dune Scholar. So, um, yeah, Kara has, has actually written her doctoral thesis on the Bene Gesserit, and that's going to be the main topic of our episode. So, uh, Kara, welcome to the welcome to the show. Like, we're really excited to have you on here and talk everything Dune and about the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. Um, yeah, let's just uh, start out with, um, uh, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Kira, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Kara. Um, I am from the US and I moved to New Zealand to do my PhD um, at the University of Canterbury. And I read Dune when I was a teenager and I've always loved Dune. And so now somehow I've ended up studying it for my main research topic, which I wasn't expecting when I was little, but uh, life takes you in interesting places. Well, and so, so what first got you into reading it? What, what made you pick up the, the book in the first place? Well, it's, it's kind of a weird story. So uh, my dad read Dune and he, so he had a copy of the series sitting on um, a bookshelf in the house. And every, it was the copy with the orange cover, the kind of, you know, it's kind of blandy, orange, brownish, you know, deserty colors and this kind of bothered me, like, why was this kind of ugly book sitting up there with this, you know, other ugly books in its series? And eventually I was just like, you know what, I need to figure out what this book is about. So I pulled it off the shelf and I read it, which is a strange reason to, to read a book, but I loved it. I loved it so much. And and then I just wanted to read all the rest of them. Um, but I I didn't read the last one right away because I didn't want the, the experience to end. So I actually paused before I read Chapter House Dune. And so, so the first the first five you, you read close to each other, or did you take some time? In yes, between? plowed through them, and then I was like, "Wait, <laughs> I don't want to finish this. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just savor this until I, until I finally read Chapter House." <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned that uh, once before. I also did a uh, uh, Dune, uh, Dune Messiah, Children, Dune, literally back to back. I just like wanted to keep, <laughs> keep reading and find out what happened to the characters. So, uh, what one of the um, the, the things that's interesting about Dune, and especially for the, for the people who, who are coming in new, it's, it's, it was originally released in, in 1965, uh, but still now, you know, you have people who are dis discovering the book for the, uh, for the first time and being inspired by it. You, you, you hear even some prolific uh, authors and, of course, uh, Denis Villeneuve himself with, with, the, with the movie, how big of an inspiration is, is it. From, from your perspective, what's the reason why you think that, that the Dune series has remained so relevant uh, to many uh, to many while the a lot of other novels from that period they don't stand the test of time or sometimes uh, you know are, are considered uh, not appropriate uh, based on our current uh, uh, current society yeah so I, I think there's a couple reasons why it stood, stood the test of time I think world building is a big factor so it's been compared with Tolkien's Lord of the Rings universe it feels real because it's based on familiar events it's based on familiar landscapes but of course herbert modifies them right so a good science fiction fantasy author takes things from the real world but modifies them to create a new world and i think the sandworms are definitely a really unforgettable feature um, that are unique from dune i think the the focus on humans rather than technology has really helped dune um, be more long lasting than some of its other science fiction companions around that same time. So Herbert was really interested in humans, what humans were thinking, how they were improving themselves, politics, you know, in rather than technology, gadgets, and space and other things that can get outdated really quickly when technology moves on or changes. And um, 
so some of his themes have been compared to uh, Shakespeare. So Shakespearean intrigue, you know, love, family, betrayal, religion, where we fit in our world, ambition, psychology, all of those things help his characters be more three-dimensional. You know, we're still interested in Shakespeare now, even yeah. though it's been hundreds of years. And be, because those things appeal to us, even though they're set in a different time, uh, we can relate to those characters and those feelings, you know, because we have similar emotions and things. And that ha having that three-dimensionality, I think, really helps elevate the, the Dune Dune series, or at least the first novel to literature, because if you look at other science fiction, some of it, well, a lot of it has a reputation, especially the older stuff as being kind of, there's cardboard characters and the whole purpose of, of the characters is just to kind of get you to the tech or get you to the interesting um, thing that they're talking about. And so it doesn't really give you a lot to latch onto where Dune gives you those three-dimensional characters that you can care about and you can keep going back to them and rereading them. I think Dune is unique in that it rewards multiple rereadings, especially at different points in your life. You can get something totally different out of it. So I still find new things when I'm going back, even though I've read it a lot. And I think the portrayal of women, which I've studied a lot, is another part of why it's um, stood the test of time. It's set in a medieval universe, but women are there. They're active. They're influential. Uh, we have the Fremen, who are not perfect by any means, but they're also quite developed and sympathetic characters. And I think there's more nuance than other science fiction books or books in general. Um, if you have native peoples of a planet, that Herbert's able to tap into more of that kind of development of them. And he did years of research. So mm -hmm. he didn't just, you know, slap this out. You know, some people just would like, you know, write a story and kind of get it published really quickly. He spent years researching and, and studying different cultures and environments and all of that stuff. And I think you can see those layers come through the book. Um, I think probably what's most offensive that hasn't um, stood the test of time is the portrayal of the Baron Harkonnen. Um, so he's, he's a pedophile, he's attracted to boys, he's quite cruel, he's gluttonous. Um, so he's intended to be a foil or an opposite to the Atreides. Um, so they're in control of their urges, whereas he's not. Uh, but he is really crafty and engaging as a villain. Um, but I think some of his characterization hasn't aged as well. Um, but having said that, I think within the world of the book, it's important that he doesn't like women and he doesn't want a Bene Gesserit around because this, this cuts him off from the Bene Gesserit, their wisdom, their advice. And, you know, he ends up not faring very well. So I, I think within the world of the novel, there, there is a significance to him rejecting women. Um, yeah. 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 And that's, that's something that we're going to go into in detail in our discussion. So about the Bene Gesserit uh, specifically. So looking forward to hear what you also have to say there. Um, before that, let's actually get into some movie news. Dune movie news. So... Uh, this week we have a lot uh, happening again. Um, the first thing is that we have uh, the new Dune movie poster that, that has been uh, been released. And uh, in case you haven't seen it yet, uh, there will be a, a, a link to it in the in the show notes. Uh, so Simon, I know for sure that you have seen that that poster. What were your first thoughts to seeing the the ensemble poster? Um. It made me want to brush my teeth with Listerine. I don't like the green on it, honestly. The green vibe. I was hoping for more of a desert feeling to it. It's nice, but I, I just love the IMAX one. As I'm looking up right now, I'm looking at the one that we got for the IMAX screening, and I feel like that could have easily been the official poster, but I get that you got to show you know, the whole cast. Like, one of my co-workers at work it's funny because now my co-workers are talking to me about dune one of them's like oh i saw the poster it looks really cool xiaoming's in the middle of it i'm like yep so it's got your attention okay cool but i get it you gotta show your main cast maybe i just like the minimalist design of the imax poster showing paul as this little person in this big epic stand planet that is dune but I get it. Overall, it's good. I'm just not a big fan of that green. I felt like it was a mouthwash commercial. You know, so Simon, I actually really loved 
that color because for me everything has been so orange and brown uh, and 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 the standard colors that we think of related to Dune. I actually like that it kind of surprised me and caught me off guard. And I realized that this this type of poster is essential for the marketing plan, right? To make sure that everyone who doesn't or isn't familiar with Dune, perhaps who hasn't read the book, isn't as familiar with this, they see all these faces that they know from other films. And I, I, I know what they're doing with this. I actually really like the simplicity. And uh, I didn't think of Listerine like you did, Simon, but I actually thought of I thought of Caladan and the water is what it reminded me of. And then I also saw something which I thought was really cool is on, on social media, I saw someone comparing that color scheme to one of the, I think it's a UK uh, Dune book cover that yeah, actually cool. from the, from the sixties, I think that actually matches that same color scheme. And I, I thought that was, I, I thought that was cool. I think there's a, a pedigree to Dune that I like that we're kind of hearkening back to at times. Uh, not that Denis is going to do that with his movie and the, the 84 movie, but I, I do like that we at least honor that this has been around. That we've loved this story for decades. Uh, well, like to hear those different uh, opinions. Uh, Kara, how about you? What was your reaction to the new poster? Yeah, I'd probably agree with Garen in terms of I like the... Um, no, sorry, Simon. I like the the deserty, yeah, the deserty kind of um, orange look and... But yeah, I get from a marketing perspective is pushing these the actors. Um, but for me, it's like, yeah, the desert and the sandworm, that's the kind of, that's the vibe that I'm interested in. But um, but I like the teal and the green as a color. So yeah, it kind of goes with that Caladan and the, um, the blue of the eyes as well. Kind of that, the contrast is nice. I wonder if we're going to get a Harkonnen version of it. That would, <laughs> that would be interesting. I hope so. Yeah, it would, would, would be good to see both both sides. Yeah, and, and I think uh, to, to Garen's point, I, I was writing about this before. I, I know that, uh, yeah, o overall, of course, the, the poster did what it was meant to do. It got all the discussion going. Uh, and there were a couple of people who online were, you know, complaining, okay, this is not creative. It's it's boring. It's, uh, it's underwhelming. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, millions of people have already seen the, the trailer, that there are all, all the people who are already familiar with, with Dune, with the book, previous movies. And the job of the poster at the end of the day is to reach out to those, those people who maybe don't know what this is uh, about and say, oh, I see uh, Timothy uh, Chalamet there. I see uh, Zendaya. I see uh, Jason Momoa. And uh, you know, seeing that star power that we have in, in Dune, I've said this before, like, you know, the cast alone is a reason to see this uh, this movie, and I think it totally makes sense for them to to lean into that in the marketing. And you know, we we've gotten all the great visuals already in the in the trailer, and we're going to get a lot lot more to come. So, yeah, I mean, it could be a more creative poster, and I understand why there's the appeal to have a more simplistic poster. But I think uh, it's 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 doing its job. <laughs> um, yeah, and one interview that that had come out uh, last week and you know we, we're starting to hear from more and more people that uh, uh, that, that have seen the movie uh, so one of the comments from uh, so we talked last week about uh, Momoa and, and his uh, his impressions and uh, David uh, Dasmalkian he also has has seen the, the movie so he's uh, he's playing uh, Peter de Vries and he was basically talking about how this uh, this movie, there's there's never been anything like this movie before, and he he doesn't expect that he'll see something like like this uh, again. Uh, Garen, what what are your thoughts when you hear this enthusiasm? Yeah, so uh, David is a is a huge fan, and again, I, I I love the fact that these actors are fans of this film already. I mean, I know they've seen it, but I love their enthusiasm. Um, I. I really loved his respect for Denis as, as a creative. Um, I, I've even heard, and I think it was this interview where David actually said uh, that uh, Denis is, is the best, the, the greatest uh, director in his opinion uh, in, of any time or any time period. So the fact that, you know, he has worked with him on, on more than, you know, one project um, I think he was actually in The Dark Knight uh, back in the day. And uh, so to be, to be cast again, I remember him being so excited about being cast in this film. 
Um, he wanted to be a part of it, uh, regardless of what role he was playing. So um, again, I, I'm a huge Denis fan, but I, I, I really respect the fact that these actors who have worked with him day in and day out in depth, they see it and, and they're as excited as we are uh, and, and, and are as excited for us to see this film that they've put their heart and soul into. And, and so it just makes me more excited. And it also makes me more confident that we're dealing with not just a great adaptation of our favorite book here. We're dealing with a great piece of filmmaking. And uh, Kara, have, have you been following all the media coverage? And what do you make of the, the comments of, of David and, and some of the other actors who have spoken about their impressions? Yeah, I, I agree that it's encouraging when they seem genuinely interested and enthused about it. Um, I just saw him in, as the polka dot man, <laughs> the, the Suicide Squad. So, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's good, and I, I'm really I'm really hopeful that um, bringing all those talents together results in a really great piece. Um, it's kind of a tension between having no name actors and having big names. And, mm. and so I, I hope it, it ends up being a really um, positive blend of, of all these um, people that have uh, done previous work and now coming together in a really potentially epic, you know, cinematic experience. Yeah, so I mean, what were your thoughts about the, the trio? It's funny that you mentioned the polka dot man because I watched Suicide Squad the other night and the habit I have when I watch a movie at home is I have my phone next to me and I have INDB open <laughs> and I didn't rem remember that he was the one that was going to be in Dune. I was like, oh wait, this guy's in Dune. Okay, I no wonder he's my favorite actor right now in this movie. Uh, once again, it's love for Denis and it's getting us excited because they're all fans but I think they're all fans of filmmaking. And that's why I'm hoping also the non-Dune fans out there, the film fans will see this movie and tell their friends and be like, you need to go experience this. You need to experience Dune. And as it's been called right now, it's Dune part one. So fingers crossed, we'll get part two soon. And uh, this week, you know, we, we thought, okay, we're great, we're getting a poster, but then uh, today, like uh, on the day that we're, we're recording this episode, we got a whole wave of uh, of all those uh, character teasers, and th there's a lot of new new footage in there. So really, they're they're really keeping the, the momentum going. Um, so so it's good to see that they they are really investing um, in, into the marketing and, and making sure that they they catch uh, people's attention with with this. And uh, at the same time, you're getting all these uh, these announcements. So there's the, um, the limited edition of the, the Art and Soul of Dune uh, that's, uh, that's been uh, available for pre-order now. So it's a beautiful edition. It's going to cost a lot, <laughs> a lot more than the, the normal edition. Uh, and there are limited quality. So if you are interested in, in that, uh, you'll have to act fast. Uh, and then there has been a um, wave of other official merchandise, everything from, uh, from t-shirts to, uh, to phone holders, uh, uh, bags. So, um, I'll start with, with you, Kara, what do you make with this, uh, wave of, uh, of Dune content that's, that's been coming out the past few days? Yeah, it's, it reminds me of, uh, Star Wars, like well, the merchandising engine, probably, okay, nothing can compare with Star Wars merchandising engine, but, um, <laughs> it's good to see that there's things that can, um, you can participate as a fan and get excited about because that's that's one thing that definitely I think has been noted online is Star Wars gives you a lot to grab on to a lot to buy a lot to kind of you know show your fandom whereas Dune really besides the 84 movie and things tie in with that um, there wasn't a whole lot to kind of be a fan you had to make your own things you know and so this this gives people something to kind of grab onto if they want to show their fandom and you know kind of proudly wear things or you know show that kind of thing so yeah it's it's nice to see like a way to be excited um in a material way because it's hard when you're just a fan of a book to show you know <laughs> besides saying i just love this book <laughs> so simon what are you buying first oh wow um i think i need a dune shirt because i've never had a dune shirt <laughs> in my whole fandom I really like the simple one with the font 
Dune. I do like the instruction manual, kind of, with the Crest Knife. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, I was surprised how much random stuff there is. And also, it looks like it's marketed for all ages. It's marketed for the young teens with the pop socket, you know, because you need a Zendaya pop socket, you know, if you're a young teen. And then there's the classic plain shirts, and it's everywhere. I'm excited. Like you said, for the longest time, it's like, I love this thing called Dune, but I only have different book covers, and <laughs> and I can't find any of the 84 toys on eBay for a reasonable price. <laughs> like, when I first met my girlfriend, she's like, so you like this Dune stuff, but you have a bunch of Star Wars stuff. Where's all your Dune stuff? I'm like, so I bought this little guy on eBay a year ago. This is what started the whole entire thing. I mean, I'm looking at my McFarlane figures. I'm I'm hoping that we're going to get more of those. So, fingers crossed. I like everything that's been put out there. There's a lot. You know, I was a child of the 70s, so I grew up consuming all of the sort of original sci-fi action figures and I mean, I had the big Millennium Falcon and everything. I had all this stuff because I was a I was a young kid. And uh and, and then as I got older and went to college, I I, I didn't really have a lot of the, the fandom t-shirts and, and, uh, and all the material that comes along with it. So for me, this is, this is a book I read when I was a little bit older. I was 14 when I read this and I'm, I'm just excited that, you know, there's enough excitement around this that people want to want to show that this is a book they love. This is a movie they love. This is a story that they relate to. And, um, I particularly love these um, like art and soul of Dune. I love books that go back and dig deep into the, the creation, some of the original ideas uh, that they had before they nailed down the script and, and, and the, the production design. Um, I, I really get a kick out of that because I love that creative process um, to see what maybe some of the early ideas around what the Harkonnens or the Atreides you know, uh, planets should look like, or their culture should look like. And, you know, they start with a lot of different ideas and then they kind of hone it down to the decision that they make to, to be uh, the original, you know, look in the film. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm also excited that so much of this stuff is coming out right now um, because again, it's just showing everyone's excitement and buy-in to this franchise. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So there's going to be, uh, plenty more to come, so we're going to have uh, a lot to discuss on, on next week's uh, show as well. Uh, but for now, uh, that's all the movie news. And let's go to the gathering of the Lansrod High Council. The Lansrod High Council is now in session. So this week's uh, topic, we're going to talk about everything to do with the Ben Jesuit uh, Sisterhood. Uh, so first of all, uh, one of the things I want to hear, hear more about uh, Kara, how, how exactly did you decide you're going to write your thesis on the Bene Gesserit and how did you make it happen? The seeds for writing my PhD on them goes back to when I was an undergrad because I actually wrote on the Lady Jessica uh, for my final year um, project in, as an undergraduate. And that turned into a master's thesis, which uh, looked at Jessica, but also on um, some of the other characters. And so I really wanted to look at all six books because the Bene Gesserit become even more influential in the later books, but I just didn't have space to do that in the limited word count. Um, so I wanted to write on them because I wanted to explore them across the whole six book series and look at how they change um, throughout the series. But why I chose them in the first place or chose Lady Jessica is because I think they're a really interesting and powerful group of women that's unlike many women that I've read about elsewhere in literature, whether science fiction, fantasy, or um, general literature. And they're very prominent in the series. And what I discovered when I started looking into them is that they have not really been given much proper critical attention in the scholarly world. And I think they're a major faction. Um, they're up there with the guild in terms of their influence and the roles they have. And I think, well, I, I assume because they're women, they just seem to be dismissed as, oh, they're just doing women things. Um, there's 
somehow just devalued in the in the scholarship. And so I thought, you know what, somebody needs to fill this gap in the research. And so I decided to focus on them. There are other women in the series, but they're definitely the most prominent. And, it, and because they're across the whole series, it was easier to compare um, and contrast. And so that's why I chose them. So I really like Lady Jessica, and I think she's the strongest one. And the easiest one to look at first, but then I also looked at other um, characters like um, Audrey in the in the final books. And when when you look at the the structure or like the, the power structure of of the uh, Dune universe, so you have all those uh, you have the the Emperor, you have the the Guild, the the, the Lance Rod, and then you have the the uh, Bene Gesserit and, and the Mentats. So how how does the how do the Bene Gesserit fit in within that that power structure? Like how do they exercise their uh, their power like of, over the the course of the the story? If you think about the setting in its feudal medieval type setting, they they're most closely functioning as the religious or kind of a Catholic Church elements, even though ironically they don't actually believe they don't actually <laughs> believe in religion. Like they don't worship. Um, a deity or anything but that's that's the role that they fulfill so they are advisors they are influencers but they themselves are not the traditional rulers which i think throws a lot of people off so like well if they're not traditional rulers then you know then they're not anything but the guild are not traditional rulers right they they hold a monopoly on transport but that still gives them a lot of influence and and the, the Guild and Bene Gesserit are silent partners um, in various things up at the high levels. And so they choose to exert power in more indirect ways, just like kind of if you think about religion, um, influencing people. And so rather than being their own, say, house, they're in all the houses, right? They have concubines and wives and various advisors and truceers spread throughout the whole galaxy. And so that, that's just, it's a different way of working and, and exerting influence, but it's definitely significant because when you're, when you're embedded, you can do things that you can't do if you're not. And, and I liked how that connects to your earlier, earlier comment about how Baron Harkonnen, he rejected them basically. So he was cut off in, in a way from, uh, uh, from that, that connection. So maybe we'll get into that more. And uh, so now, of course, we, we have a lot of people who are, uh, getting interested in um, it, in the movie and all those th those um, uh, the new content that's, that's coming out, but they they may not have re read the books. So when it comes to those new fans, uh, what's do you think the foundation that sh they should understand about who who these uh, who the benefits or sisterhoods uh, are? So I think it's really important to consider the setting of Dune before you look at the characters. So as I said, feudal medieval based society, it says right in the book, it has a rigid class system where everyone has their place. So this is not a universe where you would expect to see equality, first of all, including gender equality. So if you go into Dune looking for gender equality, you're not gonna find it because this is not the universe that Herbert creates. So if you're expecting women to hold traditional roles, you're not gonna find it because they're doing other things, right? So you can disagree with that choice of setting, but if you accept that this is the world Herbert created, he wanted to explore superhero mystique, messiah figures, ecology, then you can actually move on to see, okay, well, within this universe, what are the women doing in these roles? What kind of influence do they have? How do they compare with uh, the male characters? And so I think that the connection with the Catholic Church and Jesuits, missionaries and nuns is really helpful for thinking about how people can be influential without necessarily being the traditional ruler themselves. So you might say, well, why didn't the medieval Catholic Church take over Europe? Why didn't they put popes as kings? Why didn't they install them as emperors? Well, they didn't, right? They chose the world of religion and they chose to exert influence over rulers from a religious place rather than doing it themselves. And I think if we think about religious influence, uh, Catholic Church is still around today, right? It survived, it still has its traditions and beliefs. It's had some reformations, 
but it's outlasted many of the policies and values of the traditional rulers of the time, and it's still identifiable as the church. So we might consider that as a more powerful, influential type of leadership than a traditional king or emperor. And so I think that's if you if you think about the Bene Gesserit from that approach, um, you can kind of get around some of that looking for them to just be doing the same things that the men are. I, and like, sure, I, I think that's such an important con uh, point you made there about when, when, when an author is world building, they establish rules and boundaries for that universe or for that, that uh, planet. And, and I think it's so important I, for some of our fans to understand that he did set this up to resemble a feudalistic medieval society in the future. And, and I think I've even seen on social media people missing that point and, and just jumping to criticism of, you know, why do we not have uh, more uh, female characters that are in these, these more uh, ruler-based roles? And, and so I, I love what you've just said to us because it really helps us to see the context of where Herbert was coming from um, using the Catholic Church and, and that structure in, in a future feudalistic society. I, I hope more people and more fans will understand that because I, I think it will create a greater appreciation for the world that, that Herbert built and not jump, jump to modern day criticism, assuming that it was written in, in you know, uh, 2019 or something. This was written over 50 years ago. And it's hearkening to many, many hundreds of years in the past. So it's interesting because Dune takes place in the future, but like you said, it's very much the past. And what's great about the first book, when you think about it, is that he introduces these characters. And by the time you're done with the first book, like the last paragraph is still one of my favorite parts of the book without going into spoilers and what happens there. But he comes back to these characters that you think are just like, okay, well, they're kind of important. But by the end of the original six books, you're like, whoa, these are the main characters of this saga. Like, they're the ones that are in charge of it. You know, my girlfriend right now is reading it and she's having a really hard time. Well, if he loves Jessica, how come he didn't marry her? I'm like, it will all make sense. Everything will be explained. Just go with it. And I mean, she's already she's not even halfway through the first part of the book and she's like i love jessica she's just awesome she's my favorite i'm like just wait you'll love her even more there was a little clip in the little jessica teaser spot that came out i was and i showed it to her where i paused it. i was like see that scene that's the scene you're gonna fall in love with jessica and you're gonna be like whoa she's she's a force to be reckoned with yeah. yeah, I think uh, ex extending that that question, uh, Kara, you, you, you talked uh, beautifully about the setting, and then now I guess moving on to the characters. I I expect that Lady Jessica is going to be a, a favorite character for for many of the new fans who are coming into into the series and and watching uh, the movie. What what should people know about uh, uh, this uh, character? Being a mother does not mean. <laughs> that you can't have agency and control and power and influence. Um, a lot of women are mothers and there's a lot you can do with motherhood and maternal influence. And so that's something I've looked at, um, which seems obvious, but um, I think one thing that science fiction perhaps hasn't been so good with is showing uh, women exerting agency or influence in ways that maybe men can't or choose not to. And so if we look at Jessica as a character, yes, she's a mother and she trains and educates Paul, but that's an incredibly significant role in shaping Paul's destiny. And she, I mean, in the book at every turn, you know, she's chastising him. She's saying, Oh, you need to train better in this. You need to do this, you know, like, and he trusts her and he respects her. And, and even by the end of the book, he's asking her, can you negotiate for me? You know, she's right up there as someone that he trusts and respects, not someone he dismisses. And that's, that's a really significant role. And you can critique that she's interested in helping him succeed to, to 
to reclaim his dukedom and that she's not inf- she's not interested in in helping herself necessarily but again if you go back to that feudal world but even just everyday parents want the best for their children they want their children to be special to succeed to do well at life and so why would we expect that to be any different for this mother and especially because she's part of a breeding program where she's had an extra special child and she she really wants to be the mother of this uh, the Kwisak Haderach. And, and so she, partly she disobeys her orders, not just because Duke Leto wants a son, which everyone talks about, but she actually thinks, hey, I think I can be the, the one who births the Kwisak Haderach. And that's really, that's a significant role that she has. And she, she makes that choice. Nobody else has any control over that. She decides to make that choice. And she has a ton of skills and abilities, which I hope we get to see in the film as well. Um, which normal women, you know, can only dream of. You know, it's interesting because everyone always talks about Princess Leia and Star Wars being, you know, the super role model, the rogue woman hero. But let's go back a little bit. And Jessica was there from the beginning before Leia was even around. Yeah. I'm curious, Kara, um, and and we were able to see it. I don't know if you were the the IMAX event where we we're able to see the first 20 minutes or part 20 minutes of the film. What is your impression so far of the, of the depiction of the Bene Gesserit in, in Denis Villeneuve's uh, movie so far? And, and particularly you've talked a lot about Jessica and how do these casting choices and their, their uh, creative depiction, how does that sit with you? Yeah. So I did, I was able to go to the IMAX um, events and I, I really was impressed by the portrayal of the voice. I wasn't sure how they were going to do that, but oh, I got chills. Uh, I was really, really cool how they did that. Um, I like uh, Jessica and Reverend Mother Mohiam's demeanor. They're very calm and collected, very serious, but they have that bit of mystery about them, especially in the trailer where she's wearing the veil. Um, when she's giving the test, um, they're not weirdly bald or have super extravagant costuming like some other um, depictions. And I think seeing Jessica in a still suit was so refreshing because it just showed us she can blend in and shed her feminine appearance when she needs to. Um, she's just really adaptable and whatever the situation requires, she can do. I I wasn't a fan of the line where Duke Leto asks um, about if anything happens, will you protect Paul? I, I thought it's his mom. Like, why would you ask somebody about that? That seems pretty obvious. So I, I'm not sure really what they were going with there, but um, I am, I'm concerned about how uh, from interviews, it sounds like they're trying to give women more fighting roles. And I think that ties back into what I've been talking about in terms of equality and do women need to be doing the same thing as men have traditionally done to show the audience they're strong and tough? And I think Hollywood still tends to use men as the benchmark and say, okay, well, equality means we have the women do whatever men have been doing uh, rather than trying to envision, well, what could women be doing that's different? It still shows they're strong and powerful. Um, and so we have a ways to go in terms of being revolutionary in that regard um, because we, although the Benny Desert can and do fight, that's very limited in the book. That's not, not a focus. But there's something else I want to mention in terms of our influence, not just the, um, the Western Catholic influence, but something that people also tend to miss is Herbert's interest in Eastern philosophies. Um, so um, people are familiar with Buddhism and Taoism and those kinds of philosophies. You can see a lot of those threads in Dune as well as Jungian uh, psychology, and Jung was also influenced by the East. So in Taoism, there's this concept that's called Wu Wei, which is a paradoxical, um, basically a strategy of non-action that then allows the most effective action to occur. So when you're acting in harmony with your surroundings, then that leads to the right thing happening. So rather than kind of resisting or fighting against nature, you go with it, and that ends up being the best path which it's, it's, it's a hard idea to wrap your head around. And I by no means have done that, but um, something I looked at in my thesis was um, the Tao, Tao Te Ching. And so there are a couple examples is say you have a wheel. 
So if you look at the hub of a wheel, it appears very passive, like it's not doing anything, but actually it's essential to allowing the wheel to actually function, right? Or if you think about water, so water is considered soft and it like, it doesn't really have any effect on something hard, like a rock or a mountain, but over time, water will carve through the hardest mountain by finding the path of least resistance. So if we view the Bene Gesserit and their philosophy as a combination of Western and Eastern thought, I think we can better understand why they can't be dismissed, even if they don't have a certain title or a certain position. Their, their frame of reference is not necessarily, um, for those of us in the West, where they're coming from, right? And so the breeding program is a great example. They're, they're fine waiting many, many generations. They don't need to have it right now. They're patient enough to wait for a long-term outcome. Um, so I think that's another important part of their characterization that if you're looking for them to kind of like be hero in the moment right now, that's not, that's not how they work. You know, I think we were talking about the longevity of this, of this book and the series and it's concepts like what you just described, Kara, uh, relating, uh, elements of, of religious, uh, doctrine or beliefs and have it be reflected in a particular group of characters in this story that we that we love so much. I think that is one of the reasons the story endures because it's people that are educated in history and politics and religion, we see and feel these familiar themes. There's something familiar about the Bene Gesserit. When you first start reading Dune, even in that first chapter, there's something, even though, you realize this is 10,000 years into the future, You there's something familiar going on here between the interaction between this young this young person, this young man, and, and these two women, and the Gom Jabbar test. And so I, I really, I really love how deep you're going with the influences that that I think Herbert actually sought out. I think he what I understand is he read over 200 books in preparation to, for writing this novel. And I think it shows because there are familiar themes that we resonate with. And that's that uh, human connection that, that will endure for probably generations, quite frankly. They're realistic and they're based in things that were, I mean, I think Herbert was ahead of his time because things like yoga, biofeedback, you know, persuasion, all those things, like they were just starting to come of age in the U S at that time. And so Whereas other stories, other science fiction and fantasy, you might have women might have powers, but they're either magic or they can't control them and those kinds of things. But in Dune, they're very much seem like they might be achievable, right? If you trained your body enough, if, if you trained your voice enough, you might be able to get some of these abilities. And, and, and it's also not just a women's thing. So the psi powers in Dune can also be obtained by some of the men, right? Guild navigators and Paul also have psi abilities. So it's not just a women's thing. It's actually anyone who trains in this way or, you know, in just spice can access these abilities. And I think that's also important for not locking certain things as a women's thing or a men's thing. You know, it's actually, it's about how you train yourself that anyone could, could grab it. And I think that's, that's also makes it unique in terms of not kind of pigeonholing all oh, the women are like this because they're, they have magic and, and no, no one could actually ever do those things. Nothing against magic, but um, <laughs> I think it's cool that Herbert's able to pull in things that seem real to make their, their order. You know, that what you were just mentioning goes back to the most famous quote of Dune, fear is the mind killer. I must overcome fear. And it is that training your body and your mind to do those abilities connecting to the to the movie so we discussed that uh, a bit last week on our on our show so we have of course the uh, doing the sisterhood series coming to uh, hbo max so what was your first reaction uh, Kara, when that was uh, announced well my first my first reaction was wait a minute what are they going to base this off of <laughs> because i'm excited on the one hand but i'm also concerned about what the timeline is so it looks like they're looking at events before the original dune series rather than looking at them later where they're yeah. where they come to more prominence i think this could be a really good opportunity to explore their earlier development which we just get hints of kind of in the the appendices of dune 
I think the series is much more suited to television with time for giving that character development and political intrigue. So something along the lines of Game of Thrones, whereas film has a just a lot more compressed time frame to be able to um, explore ideas. And TV can be much less action driven and more character and narrative driven and giving, giving itself longer periods of time for multiple perspectives. Um, I was excited about the new showrunner, Diane Adamu Johnson being announced um, because if we're looking at who's behind the series, you know, it's called The Sisterhood and Hollywood has a long way to go in terms of equal representation, not just in front of the camera, but also people working behind the scenes. So I'd like to see if we're gonna have the show about this powerful group of women can we have an equal number of women involved in making it? I mean, it doesn't seem like too much to ask. And I think they could be, they could show a wide range of women, really unlimited in terms of um, diversity. They could show their missionary work. That would be so cool to see them going out with the missionary projectiva. They could show them training, you know, Herbert, Herbert doesn't give us a montage of Jessica training in the book, right? We see her when she's already has most of her skills and abilities. It would re be really great to see that development. How do you learn the voice? Um, I think that would be a really, um, an opportunity to divide, div dive into the complexities of the order. And they could, they could draw on some of the inner workings that we see in the later books to populate I think, you know, kind of how the, the Reverend Mother Superior works or things like that. They could pull from that and put that in the an earlier series. What, what are your all thoughts on that? You know, I, I was excited to hear them announce this, Kara. Uh, really excited about the showrunner a decision, like you mentioned. You were talking a minute ago about how, you know, the Benny Jesuit play a long game, a really long game over thousands of years, generations. And I, I think there's so much material to work with here with, with a series that could explore not just the things you mentioned, Kara, about the development of, of all the skills that the Bene Gesserit espoused, but also let's, let's allow us to understand at a really deep level these characters that the audience has just seen in Dune Part 1. So, so we understand who the Bene Gesserit are at a high level in Dune Part 1, but then being able to watch this television series, which gives you the, the deeper origins and background and detail around who the Bene Gesserit really are. And, and since the Bene Gesserit have, have by, by uh, the way uh, Frank wrote all these stories, they're the common thread throughout all six original books, then that can still, you could reflect that in the television series as well and have that be the common thread, but you're also exploring the Benny Chesserit's interaction with, with uh, the guild, uh, with uh, you know, the, the House Carino, with uh, the Harkonnens. I mean, there's so many ways you could go with that. But again, the main common theme is about the Benny Chesserit, which, which is wholly appropriate because that's how the original six books are, are described and, and written. So I just think it's exciting that they've done something that could go broad and deep and would only make watching the films, and I, of course, I hope they do all six books as films, um, original books, but it would only provide a greater depth to all of that, uh, all of the movie experiences. Kind of in a Marvel, you know, cinematic universe kind of a way. Let's, let's have the canonized movies, but then let's, let's also give a lot of uh, derivative products that provide depth to those original stories. How would you feel if, let's say we did get all six movies, that the show does the jump of time, like the first season, let's say it is a prequel to the original work, and then by season four, it just jumps closer to God Emperor, because there is that big gap in the original books. How do you think an audience would feel about that, and how would you feel about that as a fan? get closer to the end goal, I guess, to chapter house. I think it would be difficult to film God Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> Denise, <It's time. laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know how audiences would handle it. I mean, it could be 
it can be jarring for audiences, especially um, if they're not, they haven't read the books, but I would, I would definitely like to see the, what they're doing in those in-between times, um, kind of when their breeding program went on hold, you know, what was going on behind the scenes, there must've been a lot of turmoil. And, and if they were able to bring in the honored modders, like that would be really interesting to see um, the, the exchange between those, those two groups, again, on the film versus the television series where they could go because they probably could take the perspective of honored modders. Right. And then you could see, mm -hmm. see the action from both sides rather than just they're, they're portrayed quite negatively in the books. So a television show would probably kind of like game of Thrones show, maybe get us even to, to care about the bad guys, which is a, I think a really astonishing feat, you know, like, why am I caring about Jamie Lannister suddenly? You know, <laughs> like he's supposed to be the bad guy. But really anything they did, I mean, if they did it well, I would be happy with. Just more Benny Gesserit, better. You talked about this earlier, Kara, but um, how do you respond uh, to critics that say Herbert's original novel didn't portray women in, in a, very, a very positive light? Um, how do you respond to that? Well, so the, the particular approach that I took, because it's a, because of the setting and because women don't hold traditional roles, I chose to use a, an agency framework. So I defined agency as the way someone exerts self-determination or control and is actively involved in their life and achieving their goals, regardless of what position they have or what you know limitations they have. So I thought that would, for me was the way that I could get around some of the issues about, well, why aren't they traditional rulers or, yeah, or why do they want a Kuzak Kadarov who's a male? Um, and I particularly look at how they use their body because I think this is really significant to Dune that I don't know how, if it's even ever been done in any other books, but the amount of control that women have over their body um, and not just one thing, right? So they've got Prana Bindu, they can control every nerve and muscle. They can control their breathing and go into hibernation as we see Jessica do. They can control pregnancy. Uh, they can, they're can. they better fighters than the Sardaukar. Uh, if you look in the glossary, you know, that, which is incredible. They can neutralize poisons, right? They can access memories of their ancestors. They've got voice, they've got truce, they can speak multiple languages. They know about espionage. I mean, who, what other women in fiction can do all of these amazing things, right? Like it's incredible. And it's how they move in the world that I think is really significant, right? So they move with confidence. They're not fearful. Like they're highly educated. They're highly trained. They know what they're doing. They know they can defend themselves. This is subtle, right? It's subtle and it's been overlooked, but it's all there. If you look in the text, all the clues that you need are there. And then in the book, at least, we've got Princess Irulan's excerpts opening every chapter. Every chapter, we're reminded of women. She's shaping Paul's legacy. She's shaping the whole Atreides legacy. Um, her words are what's going to be remembered, right? And that's, and Herbert was very interested in history and how history is shaped. And um, some people say that they're, they're evil. I, I can't find any textual evidence for that in the first book that they're evil. Um, Mohiam is not the friends of the Atreides by the end of the book. So she, she is an antagonist by the end of the book, but she's got a soft spot for Jessica. She lets Jessica get away with training Paul, which she wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, we know that Jessica went through the Gom Jabbar. So that's, it's a test for humanness. It's not like something that's against Paul or against Paul as a male for any reason. Um, so I think they are feared because they're very skillful. But I think they have, I think they definitely have agency and influence and they have it in, in different ways. But again, if you look at the setting within that setting, I, I find there's a lot of textual evidence that they're very developed, especially Jessica as characters. Hey, Kara, I really uh, loved your video where you dove deep into uh, Frank Herbert's background and upbringing. Um, what would fans find really fascinating uh, about Frank Herbert and, and what influenced his writing of Dune? I think 
So he had 10 maternal aunts and they really wanted him to be raised Catholic. His dad didn't, but they got their way. So (laughs) Herbert was raised um, Catholic and went to a, a Jesuit education. And from what his son Brian says, and I think O'Reilly as well, they seem to be an obvious inspiration for the Bene Gesserit. And there's also the name there, Jesuit, Jesuit. Um, and so if you're thinking about that kind of environment, having anyone who's grown up with strong women in their family, I think can tell they exert a lot of influence, you know, even if they're not necessarily the man of the house, you know, they're there and they're very influential. And And if we also look at what the Catholic Church was undergoing at that time, the mid uh, 20th century, it was going undergoing a lot of changes and there were agitations by women for updates, changes, and something that's often unacknowledged in feminist history is that nuns were very involved in the civil rights and liberation movements. And so I think if we think about the, the tensions that were brewing within the church, which even if Herbert himself wasn't attached to, you know, he grew up in that environment and would have been aware of. Um, that is another influence. And so if we look at the Bene Gesserit, he doesn't put a man in charge of the Bene Gesserit, you know, like nuns, you know, even nuns and, and, and abbesses back in medieval times, you know, most often had a man in charge of them. You know, they were always under an authority or under the Pope, or there was always some man. So he chose not to put, put any male domination on them in the book. And I think that's significant. And um, if we look at his upbringing, so he grew up in Washington state in the U S and in interviews, he talked about, he thinks that growing up in the country gave him an attitude about self-sufficiency that city folk don't have. So if something breaks out in the country, you know, you kind of have to fix it yourself. You can't just go take it in to have somebody else do it. And I think this desire for self-control is all over Dune, but especially comes to the Bene Gesserit. Like they take care of themselves. They know how to do pretty much everything. And if we look across the series, they're the ones who end up um, succeeding the most in terms of control um, because they, they want to avoid prescience, partly because they know how dangerous it is. And if we look at what happens to the Atreides characters who are prescient, um, not great things. So it's probably wise that they wanted to stay away from that and let somebody else do it and then just try to control that person. <laughs> um, another thing was he was a political speech writer um, for a Republican senator from Oregon, and he attended the McCarthy hearings in 19, uh, 1954. And he was very familiar with the dangers of politics and political figures. Um, he was actually related to McCarthy but he was critical of those blacklisting methods that he used about um, trying to round up communists. And he was really uh, worried about the endangerment to freedom. And so I think we can see the concern with language and politics and how people manipulate coming through very strongly in Dune. And even though it's an adventure story on the surface, it's a very political novel if you dig underneath that adventure story. So I think those are, those are some things that I think provide a little bit more context to Herbert again. And as you said, he did lots of research, you know, he didn't go into this, just making things up. He knew, he knew what he was coming from in terms of what happened in the real world. Sure. I think I know the answer to this question, but uh, who is your favorite character in Dune? Oh yeah, definitely Jessica. <laughs> Who I thought. <laughs> I love Jessica. She, I think she's so amazing, and um, just getting to see her thoughts as we go throughout. I think that's another thing I really like about Dune is um, Herbert gives us a lot of the thoughts of the characters, and he usually puts them in italics so you can tell when they're thinking. And we see Jessica wrestling with you know, what do I do about Paul? And then she feels guilty. You know, this is, I raised him to be this way and I kind of knew what I was doing and now he's turned into this. And, and then by the end, she even says, you know, Mary Chani, don't follow my path. Don't do what your father and I did, you know, follow the path of love, but it's kind of like too late. And I just, I get the sense that she could be a real woman, which sounds weird because it's fiction. But again, if we look at world building, like having characters who seem like they could be real, that's a mark of good world building, right? And I think she's a really believable mother who has struggles over her children. And this is believable to me. And and it 
and her abilities just kind of help under underlie those um, those tensions that she has. And she's also in tension with the sisterhood, right? She disobeys mm-hmm. orders, but then she, you know, she comes back to the fold. So she's not just a complete rebel. Like she's still tied to that. They, they raised her. She feels strongly attached to them. Um, so that to me, I think that she's really, I like some of the other characters, but I love Jessica. Um, and when she comes back in children of Dune, it's like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we, we touched on that. Um, well, of course, the what, what Jessica her decisions like about having having Paul uh, having a son, and what the Bene Gesserit as a as an organization as a whole what what they're moving towards with their with their breeding program and moving towards the Quizzes Hadrach, and I guess for new fans may, maybe the concept can be a bit difficult to understand. What are they trying to achieve? Like, how how would you explain that like high level to a to a new fan? So 20th century had a lot of um, interest in eugenics and improving the human race, which had some really horrible consequences. But just in general, I think the idea of wanting to have your children and your offspring be, you know, be better than you or more intelligent or have an easier time um, is still around. And so Herbert is very subtle. He doesn't like to go come right out and say things, but from what from the hints that we get, the Bene Gesserit as an organization, they want to improve humanity and avoid falling back into the trap which led to the Butlerian Jihad, which was becoming so lazy that humans just let thinking machines kind of take over or let them control them. So the reason why they test people for humanists with the Gom Jabbar is to make sure that humans are not falling into animal instincts and falling onto just reactive behavior, right? So you want to be in control. And so Mohiam says, you know, a human can override any nerve in the body, right? That's the kind of level of control you should want. So with the Kwisak Haderach, what it seems like they're trying to do is create a superhuman that they then can control from a distance and without getting corrupted themselves. So Herbert's talked in interviews about this idea of power is corruptive. So the Bene Gesserit know this. So they're flawed. They think that they could create somebody that they could control without having that corruptive influence and touch on them, which you know, doesn't really work out for them. And they lose control of Paul anyway, but their goal seems to be play politics, help improve humanity through these different means but don't seize power yourself because then you'll become corrupted by it and you'll lose control. That's how I see it at least. Well, thanks everybody. That was the episode of, uh, of Dune Talk. Uh, so before we go, uh, Kara, th- thanks so much for, for joining us today. Um, I know that you've written a, a lot about uh, Dune. Where, where can people read more of your work? So I have a blog at dunescholar.com and I have... A book based on my PhD um, is in production, but due to academic publishing timelines, it will be several months before it's out. And um, I also have an article about the spice that will be coming out in November. Um, So I will be um, discussing um, that in more detail, probably closer to November. But yeah, dunescholar.com is where you can find all my stuff. Thanks for having me. Garen. Where can you be found online? On Twitter at Dune Companion and online uh, dunecompanion.com. And Simon? I just got a basic Twitter handle, no cool <laughs> Dune handle. It's Ask Dowdy. And yeah, right now it's going to be a lot of pictures of my new little pug that we adopted yesterday. Duncan the Pug <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, Marcus, and you can find uh, a lot of my writing at dunewsnet.com and on Twitter and Instagram at dunewsnet. Uh, so, um, yeah, we have uh, hope you've enjoyed this uh, this journey with us, exploring the, the lore of the Bene Gesserit. And um, we'll be back uh, next week with, uh, with more insights into the upcoming movie. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, Subscribe and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to dunenewsnet.com and add us to your social feeds. Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.